Hey students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker, and in this video, we are gonna take a look at a journal bearing example. Now, I walked through an example, kind of a hypothetical example in the introductory video where we had a fixed housing and a movable bearing. In this one, we're gonna flip this around, and we're gonna look at a fixed axle, okay? So this purple part in the middle is an axle, it's fixed. And so all of the black lines down here represent what we call a crank. Right, so if you wanted to think about this in more detail, you could think that there it is solid between the black lines. And so let me just kind of shade this in. Unfortunately, OneNote is not great about providing shading, but just kind of give you a better visual representation. So all that is solid. We have a slight gap, air gap between the, um, and I guess let me go ahead, since I did that, let me go ahead and color in. Okay, so there is the inside, there is the outside. Now I'm gonna move around this inside, so I'm gonna take away these hash marks for now, but we can see we have some dimensions, vertical distance 120 millimeters, horizontal distance of 180 millimeters, and a radius R of 50 millimeters. Okay, that is the radius of the bearing. We're given a mu sub s value equal to 0.2, and we're gonna basically walk through the steps in order to solve this problem. Noticing we're gonna solve two different versions, a min and a max value of t. So those will basically push the motion to either side of the neutral contact point. Okay, so before we get started, see if you can look at these forces, noting the purple the axle in the middle is not moving. And where do you think the contact point would be? And which direction do you think your friction resultant force would be pointed? See if you can do that real quick and then restart the video. All right, noting again, we're gonna draw a free body diagram of this outer, we're calling it a crank in this case, okay? This outer black housing. I'm gonna turn this purple axle just for the purpose of the free body diagram to gray so that it's not emphasizing it. And basically it's emphasizing the fact that we're not drawing a free body diagram of the axle. And if we think about the force here pulling over to the left, T and 100 Newtons pulling down, we can think that that would end up pulling this crank against um, the axle kind of in this manner, right? Kind of pulling down and over to the left. And so we're gonna end up with a um, resultant force. Now it turns out because we know that the sum of these three forces is equal to zero, we can also show that we end up with this kind of interesting um, geometric relationship. Oh, let me get that line better drawn from here up to that intersection point. Okay, here that I could draw that my resultant force, now this is either your resultant force of your friction, it's also in this case just a normal force, right? Because there's no friction engaged in this neutral case. And if you wanted to, you could drag all three of these forces up to this intersection point and basically say some of those forces is equal to zero, right? That would be like geometrically. You could also draw a triangle of the three of them and show that the sum of all three of them is equal to zero. All right, so there is our neutral contact point, and if we wanted to label that, um, we'll go with black here, we'll call that P-naught. Okay, so uh, it's worthwhile to bring that P-naught onto your next diagram as well. Okay, so there is my P-naught. I'm gonna go ahead and unlabel it just for clutter um, on this next diagram. Okay, so, um, that is my original contact point, and I guess I drew all my stuff for that body on the problem drawing, and so I don't really need this next drawing here. So if you want to, you can just ignore that, um, and let's go on to step number two. All right, so in step number two, if we want to have a large enough T to, in order to shift the the housing counterclockwise to impending motion. Um, again, let me bring down that uh, P naught point. So that was my original contact point. And you can think here, this is an easy one for shifting, right? Because my impending motion, right? If I have a large enough um, T to shift this body in a counterclockwise or positive right hand rule direction, my impending motion is in this direction. Therefore, my contact point will also shift in that direction. Now, geometrically, if you wanted to and draw things to scale, it's totally up to you, but you could draw your friction circle. Let me go ahead and compute what those values are going to be. Okay, so we know that my R sub F, my friction circle radius, 
uh, is equal to the overall radius, which is 50, times the sine of phi sub s. Well, I better find phi sub s first. Okay, so I know that phi sub s is equal to the inverse tangent of mu sub s. And so mu sub s is 0 0.02. Therefore, my phi sub s is equal to 11.31 degrees. And so putting that up here into my r sub f equation, so 50 times the sine of 11.31 gives me a friction circle radius of 9.81. And this is in millimeters. All right, so we have a 10 millimeter friction circle and we had an overall 50 millimeter. And like I said, so it's, it's up to you if you want to draw these kind of to scale, but it's going to be something about here, right? So our original line was basically between the center point up to there. So we need to stick parallel to that, but we're going to move the line of action out here to tangent to the friction circle, okay? And so physically, that's gonna be the line that my resultant force acts along. If I wanna go ahead and move this so I can kind of visualize what that might look like given the movement of this crank, I can see here that this now would be my r sub f, my friction circle radius, tangent to the, sorry, yeah, the, sorry, r sub f, my resultant friction force, which is tangent to my friction circle radius, little r sub f. Okay, so now we've created a free body diagram and now we have um, forces pulling in different directions. Let's go ahead and add a axis system. Uh, let me de-emphasize here the circle just so we note that we are indeed drawing a free body diagram of the crank, not of the axle. Okay, so this is my free body diagram. I know where R sub F is, I know where T is, I know where the 100 Newtons is. And so now I can go ahead and, and almost all these Journal-Berg problems, you're going to sum moments. You may end up summing forces as well, but here will at least sum moments. All right, so um, I'm gonna start with forces. Well, let's do moments first. We'll see how many unknowns we have and justify our sum of force equations. So summing forces, I'm gonna do this about the center. Okay, I call this point O. Again, assuming that the center of the axle is the center of the housing, okay? Because we're, we're assuming that the radius R from the middle out to the edge of the axle and the middle out to the edge of the inside of the housing is the same, okay? A fundamental assumption that we're making on these problems. Okay, so our moment around that point, um, we have the unknown value of T. The distance up to T was 120 millimeters. I'm going to keep that in millimeters. You could change it to meters if you wanted. Um, and then I also have the 100 Newton force. And this is going to be, so this is 100 Newtons and times the distance of 180 millimeters. And that's negative from the right-hand rule. That's why I put the negative out front there. And then finally, we're going to have the moment from our R sub F. Okay, so let me put a dot, 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 continuing on the next line. And so summing my moment of, of big R sub F, my resultant force around the center point here, is basically gonna be based upon this friction circle radius, right? So I could write this as the value of R sub F, which I don't know yet, times my moment arm, which is 9.81 millimeters. Okay, and this all sums to zero because I have a balance of moments equal to zero. Okay, but I don't know what R sub F is. I don't also know what T is. And so I need to sum some forces. So I'm going to sum my forces in my x direction. Summing forces in the x direction, I end up with negative t. It's pulling to the left. And then I'm just going to write this for right now as r sub x. I don't know the angle at which r is acting. And so its x component is just, I'm going to call it as a, an unknown x component. Okay, 
and this is equal to zero. Therefore, my tension force, excuse me, let me flip this around. Let me solve here for R sub X. So R sub X is equal to T, right? My tension force. I do the same thing in the Y direction, summing forces in the Y direction. And I have minus 100 plus R sub Y, my vertical component of my friction resultant, and that's equal to zero. And so I find from this equation that R sub Y is equal to 100 Newtons. Okay, so you might think like, wow, what do I do here? I just introduced another two unknowns, R sub X and R sub Y. I was looking to solve for R sub F. What should I do? If you bring together the information from your R sub X and your R sub Y, and think about that R X and R Y are perpendicular, because they're perpendicular, you can apply the Pythagorean theorem, right? So we could say here that R sub F as a magnitude is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of Rx and Ry. So Rx was equal to T, so we square that. Ry was equal to 100, so we square that. And so this then reduces things into R sub F. I can plug this R sub F back up here, and look what happened is we ended up with T showing up a second time in this equation. Now it didn't show up in a very clean place. Right, it showed up inside of a square root of the sum of the squares. And so this is exactly why I said that a numeric solver would be handy on these types of problems. Once you substitute that R sub F back into the first equation, you would put this into a solver. So here we could say from solver, we find out that our, uh, sorry, not solving for R sub F in this case, solving for T, is equal to 165.8 newtons. So I'm going to call this T1, just to be explicit about, there's going to be two different T's. Um, and in this case, this is going to be, actually, let's go TL and TS. We've done that before for large and small. So we'll go with the, the larger pulling force T. All right. So to set up the next problem, essentially all we're gonna do is we're gonna move the contact point instead of up to the left, we're gonna move it down to the right, okay? So down to the right will look like the following, okay? Again here, we had our neutral contact point, we have our friction circle, we have the line is going to be fundamentally it's not officially parallel. It still needs to intersect the same point up here, but nearly parallel to that point. Okay, so my R sub F for my smaller T shifts over to that other side, um, but I still have my moment arm based upon my friction circle radius. So here's little R sub F. Okay. And one more thing that I'll do here again is to de-emphasize, you know, so the contact point here, I guess I'll draw, you know, move this over. The contact point would look like that, right, of the axle. But again, I'm drawing the free body diagram of the crank. And so in this equation, it's going to look really, really similar. Um, still going to sum my moments about that center point O. And so for this one, I'll go with the T sub S here. So the smaller tension that we're pulling um, times this moment arm of 120. I have a negative moment from my 100 Newton force. Its moment arm is 180. Now I have a positive moment arm or a positive moment, excuse me, for my moment of my resultant force. And so this is going to be uh, a distance of 9.81. Again, a positive moment. And I'm going to go ahead and put in, I'm going to end up with the same exact values if I sum force X, sum force Y. So I end up with this square root. Um, so this is the square root again of T squared plus 100 squared. This whole thing equal to zero. Every equation of equilibrium is equal to zero. And so here from the solver, we can find out that the smaller of the two pulling forces T is equal to, let me put a little note here, from my solver. 
this is equal to 136.2 newtons. And so fundamentally, the difference between these two, between TL and TS, again, they're both in impending motion. One's impending motion for counterclockwise motion up here. The other one is in impending motion for clockwise motion. And really what we're doing is we're flipping the direction of our friction force. Right, in order to form, uh, let me zoom in and show this here, but in order to form um, this R sub F, right, our normal force is always perpendicular. And so our friction force being perpendicular to normal would look something like this. Okay, so that would be my friction. Um, and then for the other one here, again, our normal force is always on a radial line. So this would be my normal and here would be my friction okay so i basically have impending motion friction going in opposing directions for these two different static scenarios and realize that every single tension between 136.2 and 165.8 will keep the system static right they would put it into a static but not impending kind of situation okay so these are the bookends at anything greater than 165.8 or anything less than 136.2 this system would go kinetic but between them it will stay static thank you so much for your attention today i hope you're having a good one